Welcome to the 1000 Hours Outside podcast. I'm so thrilled today to have Linda McGurk. Um, and we are going to be talking about a book that changed my life. There's no such thing as bad weather. Is it true, Linda? <laughs> um, it is to <laughs> an extent. It's also, I like to say, it's one of those sort of semi-truths that uh, parents love to tell their kids, you know, just to, uh, to get them outside. So, um, but, you know, by and large, I think it's true. But I agree. And, you know, yeah. I tell you what, everyone talks about this book. Everywhere I see, people are talking about how this book changed their life. So, um, so excited to have you on, Linda. Linda is a journalist and a photographer who grew up in Sweden, approximately on the same latitude as the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, she spent time in nature with her two young daughters. She's a worm digger, a frog catcher, a splinter remover, a tree identifier. These are good qualifications. Mud cleaner <laughs> upper, tent raiser, band-aid provider, fire builder in chief. I love that. Um, and she was taught to go outside every day, rain or shine, because it was good for her. Um, and I know you say in your book, you know, you came to America and it was a little bit of a culture shock, right? You know, it was, it was, I noticed, um, that, uh, you know, American kids just did not seem to be as connected with, uh, nature as, uh, you know, a lot of the Scandinavian or Scandinavian kids were. And I think it just had to do with the way they were raised and just a different culture. So yeah, it was definitely a shock. And that's also what, you know, motivated me to write the book. Yeah. And you had been writing for a while. You had a blog, you said you're a journalist. Um, how long had you been writing and, and sort of mulling these things over before you wrote the book? Um, I really got the idea for it when my oldest daughter was born, because that's when it became, uh, you know, so obvious. And uh, yeah, and she's, uh, she's 13 today and uh she, yeah <laughs> and uh the book came out when she was nine so it was, it was a pretty it was a pretty long process um but uh, yeah. you know i just uh, it had to take that time i, I had to um that way the, the book was able to follow you know her or my kids progress as they got older and got through preschool and then entered you know elementary school and that and it was important for me to be able to to include all those parts in the book yeah our oldest is 13 as well so we became moms around the same time which is so yeah. fun <laughs> um so we're going to just be talking about some of the concepts and the topics in your book and i just think parents will find it so encouraging my um my personal story has been really influenced by your book. I was always sort of like the grin and bear it type in the winter, you know, like I'm just, I just got to try and get through, you know, get out a little bit, but I didn't enjoy it. And what your book did for me was it helped me reframe how I look at different weather and sort of what does this season provide that other ones don't. It just made me excited. And so, even though we were already spending a lot of time outside and even though we were already sort of um, a family that believed in the power of nature, your book uh, was a missing piece for me and our family. Yeah. So I think uh, it, it holds so much value and people constantly are talking about how impactful it is. So um, yeah, okay. I love to hear that. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of people are in that situation and I have not always, like been uh, a, a lover of cold weather either. Um, but, you know, a lot of people seeing me out there in the winter in Indiana uh, with my kids, they just, you know, assume that like, she's really got to love winter. And it hasn't always been like that for me either. But I just recognized that um, I needed to get my kids out there. I did not want them to hibernate and, and like hate, hate half of, you know, right. half of the seasons or, um, so it was important for me to sort of instill that love for the outdoors year round. Yeah, and it, your book really does that. And it's so just inspiring. So one of the topics, okay, I don't even know how to say the word. Uh, are you gonna, do you know it's- Yeah, for, give it your best shot. Okay, I'm gonna go. It's for love's live. Yeah, that's not bad. Okay, all right, all right. what is no. it really? Free love's live. Oh, I was yeah. so off. <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't terrible. <laughs> Do you say it one more time. It's beautiful. Free Luftsleeve. And this is a Scandinavian word? It is. Um, mm -hmm. 
It is a, a word that literally translates to free air life, um, mm. but it's really hard to translate. It's like a little bit like a hygge, you know, the Danish word mm -hmm. for, yeah, uh, being cozy together. Uh, free live sleeve is really, uh, it's more than a word. It's a lifestyle. It's a mm. uh, it's a, you know, cultural rhythm that is learned and passed on from generation to generation. And it sort of revolves around spending time outdoors and especially, you know, embracing nature in everyday life. Um, I love that. And yeah. I love, I love how you say it's generational. It's like, we can take mm -hmm. this concept and pass it on. One of the things you said in the book is that it says physical activity outdoors to get a change of scenery and experience nature with no pressure to achieve or compete, which I really loved that last line. Um, you know, I feel like, yeah. do you find that there's a lot of pressure to achieve and compete, especially sort of in American culture? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's kind of everywhere. Uh, I mean, just look at uh, sports, nothing wrong with that, but we're like really obsessed with sports and getting kids into sports early and it gets competitive really early and, uh, and, uh, you know, people get like really busy schedules and, uh, same thing with, um, uh, work and careers and like the American dream and, you know, you got to make money and excel at work and climb the corporate ladder and, and these are all values that we pass on to our children, right? And uh, it starts already when they're babies, uh, like uh, parents start comparing milestones and then it just keeps on going, you know, into preschool. Um, you know, uh, you have three and four year olds who are like drilled in this academic work and uh, there's so much pressure, mm. you know, to, for, to prepare them for a kindergarten and then to prepare them for the next step. And you're always sort of preparing, preparing for the next step. And with the ultimate goal being, you know, Ivy league education and then, yeah, the, um, you know, career after that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more to life, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and I think what what Freelif Sleeve does is that it brings in that element of um, non competitiveness. Yeah. Um, it's just about being uh, being in nature, and uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it's usually non motorized, uh, or it's always non motorized, I should say. Uh, so you propel yourself, and it's slow. Like I, another way of thinking it, uh, thinking of it is um, slow nature, just like we have slow food or or slow entertainment. Um, oh yeah, it, yeah. It doesn't require a whole lot of gear. Uh, you can make it very simple, um, yeah. and uh, it's just a, a great, I think, um, a, a good uh, antidote to a lot of the stress and the pressure and the competitiveness that we're seeing in society today. Yeah, I mean, you don't really hear, it's almost like we should make up our own word, Linda. <laughs> you know, like, so, yeah. but you know, there isn't that much and everything feels competitive. And yeah, yeah. I even felt it in utero, you know, you're supposed to be like listening to Mozart and put oh, these, yeah. <laughs> you know, put these headphones on your, around your belly. And, oh, you know, and the baby Einstein. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, like I have, I remember looking around for preschools for my oldest daughter and I, I went to um, to this one private preschool to, you know, check it out. And um, uh, I just came into this little room, dark, you know, and seeing these three and four year olds sitting there at these desks, uh, I mean, more or less the entire day, except for short recess periods where they had like a small black top area to play on and little swing set. And they were just drilled at these academic mm. tasks all day long, it was really disheartening. And then yeah. sort of at the and then I saw at the end of the school year, you know, they had sort of lined them up and filmed uh, as they were uh, trying to read like these short passages out of a book and, and sure, you know, they, they could do it, but they didn't look like they were enjoying it. And right. I couldn't help but wonder, are these kids still gonna enjoy reading? Um, 
five years from now? Are they enjoying it now? You know, it was, yeah. there was just so much focus on, okay, you're going to read before, before even starting kindergarten and in yeah. Scandinavia, there's just not that pressure at all. Yeah. Um, I think childhood is very sacred here that you, um, before the age of seven, people don't really have um, very high requirements as far as academics go at all. It's all about play. Yeah, I love that. We have adopted that because we homeschool, so we don't start formal academics unless they're really interested, you know, until yeah. around age seven. So, um, and that has gone really well for us. It, uh, aside from feeling the pressure, um, otherwise the kids all love to read and they caught on so quickly around age seven um, and it was fine. Yeah. You know, because they're more, fine. because they're, they're more likely to be developmentally ready at that yeah. age. So then it will be, you know, a lot quicker. Yeah, than, it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. You say um, in your book, there are many ways to get ahead in life without an Ivy League education, which I love. It's a good yeah. reminder. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, I, I hate the fact that kids um, you know, we, we, we're really prize, uh, you know, academics and, and higher education, and that's fine and well, but not every kid is going to fit into that box. And there are so many other options out there. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I like what you said too. You said boredom is key to achieving better balance within yourself, regardless of age. So yeah. that hit me because, <laughs> you know, I think we talk about it for kids, how boredom is so good for them. It's hard as a parent, I think, to push through boredom because they're whining and like, oh, you just kind of want to give them something to do to pacify the yeah. situation. But it's good to remember that boredom is good for kids. But then you put regardless of age. So I'm like, well, yeah. boredom is good for us, too. It is. I mean, that's when creativity fl uh, flourishes, right? I mean, yeah. Um, so I definitely try to keep our calendars pretty open. I do not uh, like being too booked up. I need that space. I need to make space for that boredom and creativity. Yeah. Uh, both for myself and for the kids. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about schedule. So one of the things that we do this, and I think you do this as well, and maybe a lot of people do this, just not in America is, mm -hmm. is scheduling around the weather, you know? So when we started to learn about how good outdoor time was for our family, we dropped a bunch of activities because, you know, if the weather's nice, you want to be able to capitalize on it. So you yeah. said um, whenever the weather is nice, you feel like you have to take advantage of it. So, you know, how can we live a life that allows for taking advantage of these, you know, beautiful days? Yeah. So I think so this sort of originates in the Scandinavian climate, which is, um, you know, <laughs> it's not the the most. Uh, uh, it, it's not the, the 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 people don't come here uh, on vacation for our you know climate. Let's just mm -hmm. put it that way. It's uh, you know winter is long. It is uh, it can be very dreary. It is very dark in the winter mm. time, um, and so so I think just living in this climate where it's kind of wired into us that you have to take advantage because when the sun is out and I'm sure people like in the Pacific Northwest can relate as well you know we, yeah. you get rained on all the time and so when the sun comes out it's like you know everybody just turns to the skies and you know yeah uh, turn their faces towards the sun and you just enjoy and so this has sort of created this urgency I think that is tied to the weather and uh uh, yeah, if it is sunny, you just you just have to allow yourself to be flexible and to to drop uh, yeah. other plans and and just taking advantage because you know that summer is short, just like just like life in general, you know, like it's just yeah. about enjoying it while it lasts. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, we we like to keep our calendars open and not being too booked up. I think. I think a lot of people, you know, don't realize they, they get into uh, to all these activities, especially like with the kids and all and all that. But it is nice to to allow some space for just family time and, and downtime and yeah. recognizing that everything doesn't have to be a grand adventure, you know, like every every little outing, every outing you do doesn't have to 
require a lot of advanced planning. You can be spontaneous and just take advantage of your local local areas. Um, mm -hmm. There's usually a lot to see that you might even have overlooked. Um, so, so that's you know another advice is is just trying to to uh, take advantage of what you have nearby because that makes it easier to be spontaneous. Well, you know when the weather um, when the weather is nice as well. Yeah, and there's always there's always seems to be something. We did a little walk this morning before we started schoolwork, and we saw two bunnies. You know, mm -hmm. we just walked through the neighborhood. You know, the kids thought that was exciting, and um, I like what you said. It doesn't have to be grand, and it can be spontaneous. And I liked what you said too about you sometimes just maybe skip the thing that you already had on the schedule, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, I always say like if we're gonna sign up for basketball. You know, I'm I'm gonna do that. You know, if something else comes up, we'll miss a practice. Yeah. But you do feel very pressured to not miss and um, you know, to to see that commitment through at the highest level. But yeah. you know, just to have a little more flexibility and then maybe that helps other families be more flexible as well. Right, right. Um just, so, packing a, just packing a picnic, you know, that's a yeah. fun way of, of getting outside and without, you know, requiring a lot of time or, or money you know just keep it simple it's yeah the free lift sleeve way <laughs> i love it and just knowing that it's really beneficial you talk a lot about the health benefits of outdoor play mm -hmm. um you have this quote in there that says the first step toward fewer runny noses and less coughing is to let the child spend as much time outside as possible this goes right along with where we're at in the world mm -hmm. when children are outside the physical distance between them increases which reduces the risk for contagion through direct contact or the air, the more time spent outside, the better. So, I mean, that was kind of written for like these days, right? <laughs> a little exactly. Bit. And we're actually seeing, uh, I mean, studies coming out now on COVID yeah. um, showing that the risk of uh, spreading the disease uh, outside is uh, minimal. Um, yeah especially when you, when you uh, practice social distancing. Um, and uh, I'm, I'll be writing about this in my next book, but I mean, we, the researchers, they already knew from experiences with the Spanish flu and um, tuberculosis and, and other, and, and even just the common cold. Um, it is well known that infections spread uh, a lot more easily indoors because you know there are more surfaces for the germs to uh, to uh, to stick on, mm -hmm. and the physical distance is uh, you know uh, it decreases, and you know especially at daycares and, and at school um, that's why you know kids you always have. Uh, the flu or common cold break out when school is back in session because you have all these kids gathering again inside. Right. And, um, so yeah, when it comes to uh, infection, um, there, there's no uh, question. Uh, being right. Out. And then there's so many, there's so many other things that you talk about. Interesting mm -hmm. though, I used to always think about the fall. You know, everyone goes back to school, everyone gets sick, you know, they get colds. And I thought, it had to do a lot with um, all of those things, the proximity, you know, but then my homeschool kids also tend to get sick in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it might also have to do with the vitamin D and light yes. and movement. So, so let's talk about those types of things. Mm -hmm. Like you talk about myopia, um, yes. you talk about sensory issues, ADHD, less prone to injury because kids are better able to assess risks. So let's talk about some yeah. of the other health benefits um, yeah. that outdoor play provides. Yeah, and I mean, there are so many of them, mm -hmm. uh, both physical and mental. And I mean, looking at cognitive ability and social skills. Um, but, you know, as far as physical health benefits go, I mean, look at the, the all the lifestyle diseases that we have now with obesity and cancer and, and diabetes, um, you know, uh, like being outside, it really sets kids up for a healthy lifestyle that they can keep on, um, that they can maintain for like throughout the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and, and we can see that it does have an effect already in childhood. 
So, so for example, children at forest schools who are outside for the better part of the day, um, you know, they have a, a less of a risk of uh, obesity and um, they have better motor skills and, and all that. Um, myopia, yeah, we used to think it was because the kids were uh, in front of screens, but mm -hmm. as it turns out, it's actually the lack of uh, or the decrease in time spent outside because what our eyes need to develop normally is that they need um, that sort of varied environment. They need to, yeah. uh, you know, have the long distance, like seeing objects on at a long distance and like the outdoors provides all that. Whereas indoors, you're a lot, your eyes are a lot more limited. So, right. You yeah. see that there's a depth of field, right? Where you can mm -hmm. like, you're looking really far away. Right. You see the bird fly through the sky or you're looking really mm -hmm. up close. You see the ant that's crawling across the sidewalk and there's this, so your eyes are practicing or or they're yep. training or whatever you would call it. They're, mm -hmm. they're doing different things outdoors exactly. than indoors. Right. And then, you know, uh, you mentioned ADHD as well, I think, and, uh, and, and there's several studies showing that, that children with ADHD and, and other sort of difficulties uh, concentrating at school, you know, they do a lot better if they get to um, spend more time outside. So, so there are definitely a lot of, a lot of uh, benefits and, and risk management as well. You got to sort of step back and, and let the kids um, try, try their hand at, uh, uh, it's called risky play, but I think it's a, it's a term that gets misunderstood. It's not about exposing kids to hazards. It's about um, just sort of providing the space for them to explore um, on their own. And, I love uh, that. Yes, yeah. I, yes. And, and not constantly intervening and, um, but letting them try their hand at, you know, whether it's uh, balancing across uh, some rocks or, or whatever, you know, letting, letting them, um, trusting that their bodies will tell them when they're ready to climb up that big yeah. rock or the tree, uh, whatever yeah. it might be. Right. It's not letting them play by the side of the road when they're 18 months. Right. 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 It's about, <laughs> it's about trusting their bodies. For yeah. our kids, we always would say, you know, if they needed help, we mm -hmm. would say, you know, you're probably not old enough. So they want to yeah. climb on the rock like their older sibling, but they need help to get up there. Well, then we would say, oh, well, you know, maybe when you're older, um, it's, but like you said, their yeah. bodies know. And that one of the things you said, you said the most dangerous thing of all is to sit still. Mm -hmm. That was, yeah. What it's, a it's, I think it's fascinating that um, a lot of people fear, have so many fears tied to outdoor play, but don't see the downside of letting kids sit mm -hmm. on the couch and play on their devices all day. Um, I mean, we, we are hearing now all about, you know, sitting is the new smoking and uh, that exercise is really so important and just like daily movement and um, when kids are outside they just naturally will move more um, i mean it's just too easy to get caught um, or to to get stuck on the couch um, so i think for, for that too i mean sitting is um, yeah it's really really not good for us and yeah. i i mean i feel it myself you know i have a, a, a profession you know as a writer i sit still a lot so mm -hmm. if you know if it weren't for my lunchtime walks um yeah that definitely you know you, you got to have something that breaks up the mon monotony for for yeah. uh, for your body yeah right? and get you moving you said um Fresh air impoverishes the doctor. I love that. Yeah. There's a little it's simple a things to remember. Proverb, but yeah, really, you know, like you were mentioning uh, vitamin D earlier, which mm -hmm. researchers are now finding um, is having a profound effect on our immune system and all kinds of other uh, bodily functions. Um, and we're just sort of beginning to understand all this, but yeah. And, and that's another thing, you know, because of 
the risk of skin cancer and so forth, you know, uh, the sun has gotten a bit of a bad rap, but it's important that, to remember that we also do need, we definitely need sunlight. Right. Um, so yeah, so right. that vitamin D to be. Yeah, so, and I think it's helpful for parents when you know that the mm -hmm. outside time, this non-competitive outside time is helping your kids health, especially going into the fall here. I think that's a little extra motivator you know, to go out after school, you know, to save the homework, maybe till a later time. Or one of the things you talked about was recess and in talking about ADHD. And a lot of times I remember as a child, you know, the kids that would get in trouble would lose recess. That yeah. was sort of, um, you know, the way it went. And you said that recess, you say most of which is spent outside makes up 20% of the school day in Sweden. So 20%, yeah. one fifth, it's amazing. So you're yeah. talking hours, you know, a couple hours maybe. Um, why do you think recess is so short here in the States? You know, I think it comes back to that sort of desire to maximize productivity um, that we're very focused on getting the kids to the next, you know, to, to take the tests and get to the next level and, um, uh, and all that, but I, but it's unfortunately, you know, it, it's kind of misdirected because we don't necessarily become more productive because we're forced to do a, like a task mm. um, without getting any breaks. You know, our brains yeah. need that that little breather in between, and also kids learn a lot better when they get to move around, um, and I think adults do too. Yeah, and play and, and play is also, you know, really important to, to kids uh, learning process. So unfortunately, I think it's just a matter of um, maybe not not being either. I mean, I, I don't know, either ignoring the research or being unaware of it. I don't know. Right. But it is um, I mean, with all this uh, with all this, uh, these new facts coming out it's it, it's surprising that 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 this goes on i think right like it like you should be starting to see it turn back and in some places yeah. you see you see news articles about certain places that you know they're yeah. extending recess or and um mm -hmm. and it's really helping the kids there's there's right, research right. right that shows that mm -hmm. test scores go up um yeah you know and so are there have you found things that parents can do or should you know parents just try and really maximize the time that they have after school or maybe walking to school, those types of things? Right. Um, I think it could be a combination of things. Uh, of course, the realm that you have the most power over is going to be the home, right? I mean, that's the only place where you're really in charge and, and can, you can do things um, your way. So I always, um, uh, when my kids were younger, I would, and we lived in the States. Um, we, we weren't able to walk to school, but yeah, I would definitely recommend um, families who do live close enough to the school. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great way to start the day. Um, but also what, so what I did instead was trying to make up for the lack of recess once the kids got home from school. So that would yeah. always be the first thing we did when they got home, because I knew they hadn't been outside all day. So we just, you know, forgot about homework and, and all that till later. Um, so uh, the first priority was just getting outside. Yeah. Um, so I think you got to kind of start there and then you can always try to influence the school um, and the administration as well. You can like try to get involved with PTA and, and see, you know, if there's any way in there or if you can find uh, like an advocate inside uh, on the inside, so to speak, yeah. um, that that can be really helpful as well. Because you, there are um, teachers who feel passionate about this too. Yeah, because they remember, should. Remember, you know, a lot of this your has book. changed. Yeah, yeah. Right. Give out the copies, <laughs> yes, right? and give them the book. Get in yeah. the school, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, because I'm sure. a lot of you know a lot of this has changed in the past few decades, and there used to be more recess and more outdoor yeah. recess the kids used to be able to play outside in the winter and now they're not I mean older teachers have told me this yeah. um, so I think that that there is some support among teachers 
um, at the school. So it's just a matter of how much uh, you can get the administration to uh, to go along with it. Yeah. But you know, it doesn't hurt to try. Um, mm -hmm. I yeah, I definitely recommend that. But uh, if you can't get through to the school, you can at least change, um, you know, the way you do things at home and yeah. your, your own routines. For sure. You know. So, okay. So let's talk about winter. So you said some schools, you know, they're not letting the kids go outside um, in the winter. It's probably one of the biggest questions that we get at 1000 hours outside is what about winter? Um, you said in the summertime, it feels like a victory when you stay outside all day long. I agree. In the mm -hmm. winter time, the kids don't always feel like going outside and nor do I, especially if it's dark and slushy. But then I remind them how nice it is to come inside after being outside. So, so tell us about the winter. Yeah, so obviously, um, I think the first step to enjoy winter uh, is, it's, it, you know, it's dressing for the elements. I can't, and I cannot stress enough how important this is um kids who are not dressed appropriately and adults uh, mm -hmm. i should add uh, will not enjoy it if they get cold and wet um you know after being out out there for five minutes now that's not going to end well so if you want to be out for any longer amount of time um yeah like dress dress for the weather and um uh you know then it, it's just about creating a habit, I think. I think this is so important um, that it's it's like a rhythm, you know? We, we always go outside, even if it's winter and the kids know that. Um, and uh, when you do it from when they're little, they come to expect it yeah. and it becomes normal. And uh, because they know we do it because it's good for them. Just like we try to eat healthy and uh, yeah you know, do other things that are good for them. Yeah. And, um, and, and there are so many fun things that you can do in the winter too. And usually kids, um, like once you get outside, like the hardest part is often getting out the door, right? Yeah. Both the, and the kids. Yeah. And you just have to sort of get across that mental barrier when it's dark and like, yeah, when the weather is nasty. And they're and, little and you've got to get their hands yeah. and mittens. I mean, it is yeah. hard. <laughs> We can and take it takes 45 like 20 minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just to get just to yeah. get dressed to go outside. Yeah. Um, but you know, I always think I, I when I struggle with my motivation, I always try to think to the next step. And that is, you know, I know how good I'm gonna feel mm -hmm. about having gone out once I come back in. Yeah. Then I'm gonna feel that it's all worth it. Like even if we don't even do anything special out there, just getting out there and getting the fresh air and moving along, you know, moving around um, and then coming back into the warm house, um, you know, maybe having some hot chocolate and, and it, it makes it all worthwhile. And yeah. it's all, I think, I think we, I believe that we need those contrasts in life um, because it makes the, our feelings uh, much more powerful and stronger, you know? Um, and I think also it's important for kids to understand like what, you know, how comfortable they're like, how comfortable it is inside. And it's also important to know what it feels like outside when it's really cold, because it could also be, um, you know, like in, in a survival situation or something like that. I think, um, uh, it's, a it's a form of mm. prepping, if you will, like yes. prepping kids for for the realities of yeah. um, life. You talked about that. You said being able to cope with different types of weather will make children more resilient. That's mm -hmm. a big deal. Yeah, it is. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, resilience is one of those um, predictors of future success mm. in life uh, and work as well. Right. Um, I think, I think, um, I work pretty hard on instilling resilience or grit in my kids. Um, yeah. and, and it's a balance, you know, you don't want to push them too hard, but still I want them to be able to, you know, see a challenge and then be a little bit uncomfortable, um, but knowing that they can do it. And wow. it's all, you know, like when you, I mean, when I take them hiking and when we, 
sometimes we'll, we'll climb a peak or, and, and things like that. I want them to be able to, to visualize that peak and, and, uh, and know that they can do hard stuff. I mean, that's, that's really yeah. going to be invaluable to them in life, I think. I, I really it, love that, Linda. Better. Yeah. Yeah. You it's a different way. Any, I think you can apply it to any area of your life, really. Yeah. It's a different way to frame it. And resilience and grit, those are things that you can't really measure. No mm -hmm. one teaches you how to teach those things. Right. But, you know, if you have it in your mind that, hey, taking my kid out, you know, in the snow and in the cold and in the dark, you know, for 25 minutes or, or 45 minutes, that's going to help them learn that they can overcome things they can be in mm -hmm. uncomfortable situations um yep. those are really big yeah yeah yep. yeah i love that um what about babies people ask a lot about babies so we um you know we always just we had a lot of babies so we yeah. just brought them along in those little packs you know a little <laughs> and um uh, but you talk about how you know in scandinavia that daily fresh air is seen as essential for babies, ranking just behind food, sleep, and the nurturing love of a parent. So what about babies? How do we get babies outside? What age should we start? Um, you talk about napping in your book. I yeah. think a lot of people want to know about babies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a common misconception that babies uh, cannot um, handle you know, being outside in the cold. Um, but obviously this practice of, um, putting babies outside to nap all year round and, and which is, uh, very common in Scandinavia, I think that sort of, uh, uh, disproves that. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, babies need fresh air just as much as older kids and adults for that matter. And, uh, uh, napping is an excellent way of starting to expose them to the outdoors. Um, it may not seem like much if they're just sleeping out there, but you know, when they go to sleep, they can still hear um, the sounds of nature and it's, it's a very soothing environment. And um, uh, so as far as age, yeah, well, my, my kids, um, you know, not babies anymore, but when they were, um, they were both born in February and they napped outside from when they were about two weeks old. Wow. And, uh, you know, you just got to make sure that they are once again dressed appropriately and you don't, uh, you, you don't want to bundle them up too much. Um, you want to dress them like you would dress yourself, you know, to be comfortable in, in the cold weather. Um, and same in, in the summer you just have to watch so they are not yeah definitely don't expose them to direct sunlight if they're asleep and um, just uh, yeah watch watch the temperature for sure mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, you know you and if you if you're wary about leaving them outside on their own in the stroller which is common in Scandinavia mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you know just uh, go yeah Take, take them for a walk in either a carrier or a stroller and uh, you know you get some exercise too yeah, yeah. I mean our yeah. kids our kids napped better outside than they did inside for sure yeah. you know and they'd always fall asleep in those carriers um, and I had read that even just being in the carrier when they're awake is good for their eyesight because with mm. each step you know they're having to track the up and down motion so there's so many benefits for getting babies outside too just their sensory um, stimulation and our kids love to look For at the sure. trees. You know, the trees are like yeah. nature's mobile, you know, just always kind of yeah. with the wind. And um, yeah. you said that the ideal napping temperature, this is in <laughs> Finland, yeah, is perceived as 21 degrees or negative six degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's chilly. And yeah. that, um, many parents let babies sleep outside as low as five degrees, which is negative 15 degrees Celsius or even mm -hmm. colder. So, I mean, I've, I've never seen this here in the States, um, yeah. but it, it yeah. but you, it's common in other oh, countries, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. In, in this particular city where they conducted the study, 95% of the parents do this. Uh, <laughs> and, it's uh, almost everybody. Yeah. Yeah, almost everybody. So it's, it's very common. And I should mention because I do get the question sometimes, well, you know, people ask about uh, sudden 
infant death syndrome and uh, baby uh, or child mortality rate and so forth. And it is, it's among the lowest in the world here in Scandinavia. Wow. So, um, so wow. this is definitely, uh, you know, if it were at all risky for the babies, I can guarantee you that the doctors would not recommend it, but they do. Yeah. The doctors do recommend it for babies wow. here. That's so, so interesting. It's very interesting how, how even like in the healthcare system, you know, the, how the culture can be so different in the attitudes. Um, it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. But I think it goes back to our heritage of Friluftsliv once again. Yeah. yeah. I want to um, sort of close out here. I, I found a lot of just fun ideas in your book. Um, <laughs> which are inspiring. You know, you see these fun ideas and you think, well, I could do that. So um, one of the things you talked about was a sledding party, um, mm. which I thought was really fun. Um, you talk a lot about outdoor cooking uh, year round, which was new to me. Um, you know, we did a campfire in the winter for the first time and the kids did s'mores, you know, roasting marshmallows. Yeah. And that's magic to have a mm -hmm. fire going in the winter. So what are some yeah. of your fun favorite you know, ideas to do outdoors? Uh, cooking is definitely a favorite. Um, and uh, I think the key is really, like I said earlier, just to make it simple. A lot of times mm. when, when we meet up with other parents and kids, we just uh, decide on a park or somewhere where there's a, a grill and uh, this place for the kids to run around and we'll go for a short hike together because we find that the kids do a lot better if they have other kids around yeah. and so we'll do a short hike and then we'll um, grill grill out and um, just have a meal together um, sometimes I mean there are uh, more sort of organized activities as well there's this thing called a quiz walk that's super popular here in Sweden where you uh, where there are questions placed along like a trail and so and then you bring uh, so it's like a little uh, you can win prizes and like to, so you go around and, and you um, answer the the questions and you can win prizes um, orienteering is another favorite uh, mm -hmm. it's where you look for like hidden stations out in nature and you got to use like a map and compass to find them it's a, like a little known sport outside of Scandinavia but it does exist in the U.S. Uh, but it's uh, <laughs> it's sort of obscure but the kids here do it at school and it's great because that you know at the same time they learn to navigate using a map and and reading wow. um, the landscape which is very useful um, so you know so there are just a lot of a lot of things you can do, but the most common way for us to get outside is just um, going on a simple walk uh, near our house and uh, yeah, just seeing what the, what nature is doing at, yeah. at the moment, you know? So like right now, we just the other day, we went out on a walk and we looked for signs of fall. And so it's just about observing um, changes in nature and, maybe seeing if there are any, uh, anything to forage and, and things like that. So yeah, we try to keep it simple most of the time. Yeah. And it's still so enjoyable. I love how you said, eat as many meals as possible in the open air during the warmer months. That's a good, yeah. that's a good challenge. I think you said there's something yeah. like everything tastes better outside, which it is does. true, which is true. Cause you work. Yeah. Cause it seems like you work harder for it. Yeah. You know, outside and it's just, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up here with a quote. You said, um, no matter how lousy a day starts out, we can almost always turn it around by going outside and enjoying nature together. So that's a quote yeah. from your book, Linda, if people want to find you, if they want to find your book, um, you said you have another book coming out, you know, where, yeah. where can they find you? So I have an Instagram and a Facebook page uh, where they can find me searching for rain or shine mama. And that's mama with two M's. Mm -hmm. And um, I also have a website, uh, lindamcgurk.com. 
And my book is on uh, Amazon and pretty much any other online. Yeah, it's uh, everywhere. Book, book retailer, yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah, it's really worth reading. One of my favorites Thank changed you. our life. Like I said, it was a missing piece for me. Yeah. And I constantly am seeing people post about it. Um, you know, it's one of those ones that forever is going to be impactful for families. So thank you thank for you. writing it. Um, could you tell us a favorite childhood uh, memory of yours that was outside? You know, I, I've been thinking and thinking and uh, I, it's just hard. It's so hard to pick one. I mean, there are just so many. Mm. Um, but when I think back on my childhood, you know, I grew up, um, close to a lake and with the woods backing up uh, to our house and uh, I think you know and remembering just the summertime and running down to the lake um, with a picnic and just you know spending the entire day down there swimming eating swimming swimming some more mm -hmm. and then eating some more and uh, you know I think that just seemed I think that's just the most um positive uh yeah positive memories that i can uh that i can think which of. i love because it's so yeah. simple it is you know it doesn't have to be more than that i think to right. be really impactful for kids you know yeah. just a good food you know and water or mm -hmm. whatever that's beautiful yeah. well linda really appreciate your time really appreciate your book and all that you're doing and excited to see what comes next. I want to read more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Teach me how to say. Do you live to live? <laughs> there we go. There we, go. Oh, we got to come up with our own word. Well, thanks, yeah. Linda. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jenny. It was my pleasure.